Uh, thank you, all of you in the room, for joining us here, and all of you out on the Howl Round. Uh, thank you for being with us. This is part of our Puppets in the Green Mountains International Festival, our 12th biennial festival. We've been pretty much every other year for the last 28 years. So this is a component of our festival. There'll be three panels throughout, and this is the first of our exciting panels that have been produced for you today by Mackenzie Doss, Sandglass's managing director. Thank you, Mackenzie. And I'm Shoshana Bass. I'm the director of the festival and artistic director of Sandglass Theater. And I'm super, super excited uh, to hear what these amazing artists here have to say today. And um, we're also, we'll be joined for all three panels by our amazing youth facilitator, Alex Aether. <laughs> Alex is a student at the New England Youth Theater, at least that's how we know Alex. Of course, you have many other identities. Um, and so this is really an exciting collaboration for us as well to have you here. As all of you know, there's an entire festival going on. So there are a whole, another weekend of performances ahead of us. Welcome, Caden. Um, <laughs> there'll be a, a big gala for a uh, fundraiser for Sandglass and honoring the festival and its continuation on Thursday. And then we'll launch into an entire weekend of performances and two more panels right here at 118 Elliott. So thank you for having us, Lissa and John. We're really excited to be with you. It takes a community to put on a puppet festival. So you all are part of it. You all online are part of it by extension. So thank you for being here. Uh, I don't want to talk too much longer here, apart from thanking HowlRound, thanking FACT TV for helping us make this live stream possible thanking our live captions for, for being available to make this as accessible as possible. So that's all I'm going to say for today. And I'm going to turn it over to Alex to introduce our panel. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Alex. Um, I'm 15 years old, and um, I'm a student at the New England Youth Theater, where I have been for almost 10 years now. Um, um, I um, perform in many different ways, but um, I'm so excited to be here today to um, show off these amazing panelists. Um, Vera Longtoshian, Alice Godschuk, and Chavi Bobes. Um, so I will hand, I will tell you that you have a mic <laughs> um, for you to introduce yourself and explain your part in the festival. Okay, hello, my name is Vera. As Alex has already told you, um, I wear a lot of different hats in the New England community. Just a few of them are as a scholar and educator, an activist, and also as an artist and curator. And I'm a citizen of the Elnu Abenaki tribe. I'm fortunate enough to serve the community as the executive director of Vermont Abnaki Artist Association, where I work with cultural objects and artwork all the time, curate either through curating museum exhibits or promoting it um, and educating the public about it. So that's a nice start, I think. Thank you. I'll pass, pass the invisible mic. Thank you. I'm Alice Gottschalk from Germany. And I performed yesterday. I'm a puppeteer. I'm a teacher. I'm a puppet builder. I'm um, a director. And um, the performance yesterday, I was working with a combination of string puppets and robotics. So I'm interested in the combination of different technologies. I give it the mic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hello, I am Xavier Bobes. I come from Spain, from Barcelona, and I'm here because we're going to present a show. Uh, it's called Things Easily Forgotten with Francesco, who is performing the show. And it's an object theater show that talks about memories in lots of places, but mainly in Spain. 
this case. Uh, but it has something universal because it talks about families, it talks about mementos, what we have in our pockets and what happened with them. I've been also having a beautiful workshop with uh, people from here. I'm really happy and really appreciate it. This opportunity to share with the community here. This experience has been really beautiful. Thank you so much. All right. So the theme of this panel is going to be objects writing in memory. So we have about three questions all surrounding that for our artists to elaborate on and answer. And then we're going to open the floor up for some questions from the audience. So if you have any questions brewing, just write them down mentally, or if you brought paper. Um, so our first question, um, and most of them are in two parts, so you can do that as you will. How do you relate to the objects you work with? And do you feel there is a memory inherent in those objects? Fabi, would you like to start? Well, I am a, I can help. I keep on my life collecting objects that I can find in so many places. And lots of things that have come to my life, it's because I wasn't expecting them. So I've been learning lots of stories from the objects. And this is the way I created things easily forgotten. This is the way I also try to share when I am offering some workshops that things can get you farther than what you are expecting. And actually, it's a kind of gift because what you can have in your hands belong to somebody that could teach you so many things without having a, a direct interaction with this person. But that person inherited that knowledge from somebody else. And what I have there in my hands now is an opportunity to pass it to somebody else. So I'm just following the chain and I can fill it with the objects. They give you this opportunity to belong to a kind of chain of people that really teach to each other in a way very intuitive. And that's what uh, really amazes me. And I really think um, with objects, because they go from hand to hand, they keep on moving. And this is what we do with them. We just move them around. But what we do with them is living. And living meaning it means uh, taking decisions and changing our mind and committing mistakes, growing up, being sometimes fair and sometimes not. So I think this is uh, what makes me feel so touched for things because I really think I have an opportunity, but I think also uh, I must be responsible of that inheritance because it's valuable because it belongs to everybody. Okay. That's beautiful. Thank you. Alice? Well, uh, um, I would divide in objects I create and objects I find. Mm -hmm. So when I have objects I create, um, I put the history inside while I'm creating it through my process. And when I find objects, I, uh, that's like, like you said, I, I, I inherit some uh, history already. So I, I, I would divide this in these two parts. And then there is also, if there is a, um, a memory inside, I always feel there's an individual memory, which I bring, which connects me personally with this object. And then there's a collective memory in the objects, which, and it differs from every, every, collective you live in and so again we I see also these two when I, I work this out mm -hmm. thank you Vera I think I share a lot of the same feelings as um, the other panelists here um, in that there are two different components there are the objects that I work with when I'm curating and curating an exhibit or when I'm writing an article or I'm doing a presentation and those objects are generally historic objects that have also been touched by many people along the way. And they inherently carry a stone language. It's not a written history book, but
but if you study an object long enough, you learn so much about the people who made it and used it. You can look at the materials, you can look at the way it was processed, the way it was put together, you can smell it and see if it had a certain type of food in it. A while ago, I mm -hmm. had, I had the um, fortune to pull a vintage cradle board, and when you sniffed it, <laughs> You could tell what it was used for, even though it probably hadn't been used in 80 or 100 years, possibly even more. Um, and I've seen that also with um, woven pieces that are in museum collections that are made out of plant fiber, and they still have the residual of the berries that they held. And so it tells you something about the people that held it, the people that used it, and the people that made it. And then there's this other piece as a creator and an artist myself, where once again, like you, I also put memory and and um, history into the objects. Also with the belief that many of the materials I work with are natural materials, natural fibers. So um, also believing that they are alive and they have their own spirit and sometimes they want to tell you what to do with them versus the artist just saying that you're going to be up whatever it's going to be. Um, so I think it's it's two parts with, with objects, artwork, and um, memory. Thank you. All right, question two. How do you feel humans affect the memory of objects? And how is that memory per perceived and preserved through the communities it's a part of? Um, and also, how does this spark the imagination of said communities? Here, would you like to start? Sure. Um, so I think there, once again, nothing is, is just a singular one road. If you're gonna ask me any questions, we can meander in many different ways. Um, but what I'm thinking about with the object is the memories that live in the community as an oral historian, I do interviews with many people. And if you talk to an 80 or 90 year old, you're not just learning their memories, you're also learning their parents' memories and their grandparents' memories. So you could be talking and listening to memories that might be from the 1880s or even, even longer. Um, a lot of families practice oral tradition and these memories are passed sometimes with words, but also in those objects. Sometimes somebody will hold an object from their family as they talk to you and they tell you stories from their family. And so those memories are contained in there um, in, as a container in the object, but also in their minds as they relay these memories. Yeah, and I would think they're also in the bodies because we, we act with the objects, we touch it, it has a certain purpose. So um, there is always a communication between the ob objects and us. So it affects our bodies. It brings something to us. And so I think it's, of course, it's in the memory of a collective how they use objects, how how we we have them on our bodies or in which use we have it. Yeah. Of course, so there is a connection. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's quite funny when when you meet somebody because there's something between you that uh, you both of you you are like in love yeah it's like an excuse to talk about something and then you talk about something else and then they offer you house the house to to show you more things like uh, I've been doing some some shows with a collective in Spain called El Solar and we have been working in different collectives like uh, that are been working and living different experiences and always what they share with you uh, you can afford it it's like so much like uh, it much it goes much farther than what uh, you were expecting it's always going uh, somewhere else uh, for example we were working in a in a uh, in a shop uh, that the owner was the fourth generation of that shop and he was just showing us all the material that they had for 100 years and actually the material uh, were bills most of them we could see like the chronology of the 100 
years of a place that was related to the surroundings from the village, from everywhere. So I think that sometimes one object is just an excuse. It's just let's see that takes to, to another, to another, to another, and people need to share. I realize so much that we need to learn and people need to share things, experiences. And an object can be a nice excuse, somehow, <laughs> to interact. Well. Thank you guys so much. All right, Thanks. here's our third question. It's a big one, it's a doozy. <laughs> <laughs> what happens to the art when the artist has passed on? How does or does not the memory of an object live past the artist? Alice, would you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we hope, of course, that it will live on. Yes, but I think that's how, um, again, how the how this um, art was perceived by the audience and how they connected through the art emotionally. And if they have a connection, a relation through art, it will probably, through the, this special art, it will go on. But I also think when I look on, on all older, like we don't know, like the, the painting on, on uh, walls, very old painting on walls, we don't know what it was made for. We didn't know if this were artists or if this was memories. And it, it leaves a lot of space for interpretation. So whenever we perceive an, an, something, um, we, we interpret it from our point of view in society at this moment. So it, it, I would be curious how they, the future generations perceive my artwork in their, out of their way of view of the world. So, um, so we don't know, but it, it makes me very curious. Well, I think, uh, uh, Maybe I repeat myself, but uh, uh, what objects uh, offer is an opportunity to to keep uh, memories alive. So I don't think it's gonna pass away. It's gonna just generation after generation. Uh, they will share these memories, and they will become actually present always. Uh, I am just part of the chain. And I don't need to be there all the time. <laughs> I like, for example, this show I've done, and plenty of years now with Francesco, who's performing it. And I'm just talking with uh, detail, but uh, the things that we are working with, they come from the 40s, the 50s, from Spain. And I'm sure they were being performed at home in a way, sometimes the way that we've been using them and we are happy that they keep on moving and i hope these objects one day somebody will find them in the street in a market like you got <laughs> them in the free market and get curious i hope so because I, it's really sad when things disappear and we lose an opportunity to remember an opportunity to realize that we are very little and we are just tiny in a second we can go, no? So I think uh, this is something that, well, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's very true. And I think it depends on what the history of a particular object or piece of artwork is. Is it something that's handed down from generation to generation of the family, where, is that, where there is that continuity of the story? Does the artist need to be there to be present in the memory? Maybe, maybe not. Because how much art is sold in markets and galleries online today where the purchaser maybe can read a description of the artwork that's maybe, maybe it's just one of those tombstone labels that tells you the materials, the year, the method, and maybe it's a little story that's a paragraph. Um, and what do they take with them? What do they remember that? So one person might purchase it and hand it off and give it as a gift to somebody else who maybe doesn't have that original information. And so that's a puzzle piece that I sometimes work with in my work where somebody might contact me and say, we have this particular type of object. Uh, recently, somebody contacted me about a basket they had. 
and they didn't know what to do with it and they you know wanted to try to authenticate it and and find out what the whole history and background of that piece was and sometimes we're just never going to know you know sometimes we can put it together with information from other informants from the region perhaps from history from history books from art history books from town histories but we're never going to know but it's still in there it's contained in there and hopefully at some point somebody is interested enough to some kind of unlock that and people are going to want to keep those things um i know there's this whole second you know secondary third area market for artwork and cultural objects you know that end up eventually going out to ebay or maybe to finer auction houses and things like that so hopefully people continue to have that desire to want to know to want to learn and um i think technology is pay, playing a big part in that in in and I think I should stop there because that might be the, where we're going. Um, but I think technology in the future is going to change the memory with objects and our work. Questions? Oh, so how do you think that technology will change the memory <laughs> in that? <laughs> You know, it's interesting um, because that's something that our team is looking at and stepping very carefully with. Um, we're working on a digital exhibit right now, and there are so many different questions we're facing. So I can't say that I have the answer of what's going to happen, but I know our team is asking the questions about what is it appropriate to put out versus what's not appropriate to put out or um, how how much is okay to share, I think is, is one of the questions that's happening. How much of the creator is okay to put out there because even if they've passed on, they still have family members. And so there there's all this other information. So an artist may, who is alive may be an open book and tell you anything or everything, you know, like this video, this is going to be here forever, right? Um, the internet isn't going away. So I think that's something we have to really start looking at, you know, I'm sure your performances and your pieces and education is being videotaped and is going to be out there. So I think memory in these physical objects is going to change because we may not necessarily have the physical objects, but we're going to have all this technology that's going to hold the memory about the objects as long after um, physical objects may be gone. Yeah, and I think also about it's a two-dimensional memory. And objects, it's always related to our bodies, again. So I think it's very interesting. Even if we have this memory, it won't um, yes, it's an replace. replace, thank you. It won't replace the original object, of course because it's bound to our bodies. And if we, we discover the whole world through, through, um, through our bodies. If you look at a child when it plays, it, it has eight relations to every object, yes? It, 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 it's the sound object, it balances on the body, it tastes it, it, it uses it as a puppet, it, it transforms it, in it into another object. So it really discovers something in, in, in his physicality, in his purpose, and it's all all in the in the hands, so we I think digitality can help to keep a historical point of view on it, but not the sensible point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, completely. I agree. I, uh, I I'm quite scared of technology, and what I do, for example, I don't record my plays, like things easily forgotten you cannot see anywhere because it doesn't exist. About recording there are no pictures because i don't want people to have a look before they come and it's a small show and if they spoil it with some images people cannot go through that and one day there will be no show and there will be no images i'm not at all uh, worried about it because i know so many people will have a memory like we have and it will 
it has been like that for years and years. So we are just now obsessed with images and storage. And my storage, my mind really doesn't have that much space. <laughs> so um, okay. I think sometimes it's better not to know. So you can imagine in another way. And it's yeah. also not the same, yes. I think if I uh, film my performance, it won't give the atmosphere or the communication I have every time with the audience. It yes. gives. I think we saw this very well right when we did during Corona the filming of the performances and streaming it. It didn't work as well mm. because film makes choices. It's and in in the theater the audience makes the choices, and it's an interaction. It's mm -hmm. a, it's not a, a one way thing. And it makes sense. And technology is changing physical objects as well. Some of you may be aware of some of the technology I'm going to talk about, or maybe not. I don't know. Um, but there are websites like Sketchfab where somebody can have their own landing page and you can do 3D scanning of, of objects and artwork and upload that so on it, the user and people can take that, twist it, and turn it around. And if somebody has 3D scanned an object, whether the original object is continues to live on or not, if it's been 3D scanned, it can be 3D printed. So if you think about famous uh, sculptures and things like that, if they were to disappear, somebody can 3D print it. It wouldn't be, let's say it's a stone sculpture, it wouldn't have the same feel to it, that that coldness you feel in, in um, stone sculptures. It would be like printed with like plastic. Mm -hmm. But the physicality of the shape, you know, you would be able to touch it to feel it. Um, so these are really interesting things to think about, you know, and what happens if all the tech, if everybody puts all the eggs in the basket of technology and the technology fails us, you know, we've seen in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of change. I remember being very small when there were um, the eight tracks. Does anybody remember eight tracks? I was really small with them. Yeah, yeah. And then the new thing was the cassette tapes, right? And then we got the floppy disks, and, and we eventually moved on to uh, CD-ROMs, and, mm -hmm. and now we have those little um, thumb drives. But also the formats that thing, the file formats have to be updated. If you have a collection of objects that are digitally stored, as in museums, and um, every so often, that's something they have to do. They have to make infrastructure investments to update these things. Mm -hmm. so, Everything's not an eight track in a museum. Right. <laughs> so we're going to open it up now for questions from the audience. Oh, now. This was not what I was expecting. <laughs> <laughs> it's so always, yeah. yeah. It's the object. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea of having the microphone not plugged in. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings us to theater. Um, I want you to so many wonderful things for this conversation, and, and so I have to choose one. Just to add to that. Um, I'm thinking of an Italian puppeteer, Hungarian actually, but in this area, you might know Tilda yes. Molnar. Yeah. And um, I remember talking with uh, Giula, years and years ago, and he said that the objects that are most interesting to him in theater, in making object theater, are the ones that are missing. He would do, and I can give you some examples of that, but, but, I, but I kind of like just to throw this, this uh, enigmatic idea out there. He would, he would create a show around the object that he needed but didn't have. And there would be ways that he would hint about that. And so um, perhaps I'll just say, uh, could you talk about absence? <laughs> I think absence creates 
spaces where we can fill in with our experiences. And um, I think that was Julia. Julia worked a lot with the uh, and with the imagination of the audience, of course, and their feelings and their um, their experiences. Mm. And so that's I think that's why it, it makes often like puppetry, for example, very emotional because you see only a fragment of life. Yes, you see a very reduced uh, movement. Yes, you don't see a, a, a human fully imitation. You just see an, an idea of it, and your mind, your personal mind, finish this picture. So there, there are researches by um, neurologists, and they say if you have like ten white points, it's ten points in a black space on your body sideways, and the the the, the human who has it moves in the, in this black space, and the other uh, person outside just sees this ten points can read emotions, can see what, what, how it is. So our brain is so capable to, to put um, our experiences or inside our, our um, Erfahrung, yes, experience, yes, inside and uh, make this picture complete. So absence gives us, the, as spectators, the possibility to engage. That's really important because when I was talking about technology, it's absence of experience with the original object, right? Where there's, it leaves a lot to be imagined, but there's so much also that people may not think about, you know? So it's very important to have that human experience. Mm. I think uh, really sometimes when you get an object, uh, what it what it takes you to a place that you will never be, you will never be in, the, in that place. So uh, absence is present in this place. I remember just for example one one performance that uh, we were in a place that doesn't exist anymore uh, in Barcelona. It's the where there is Montjuic. It, there is like the mountain with the gardens. And the botanic garden used to be before a place for favelas, full of favelas. But they move everything around. They put the botanic garden, and there's plenty of people that go there and just go around. And they were the people that were living there. And we did a show there talking about them. And what we did, for example, because we didn't have any objects, we, didn't, we couldn't take anything, even there was just one uh, tree in the right place and what we were doing we were drawing the houses with water what they were telling us where they were on the floor and because we were work working with the water and it was summer we were drawing them and at the same time we were talking about them they were disappearing because it was water and we were going through the park and we just mm, we were just giving the absence presence for a second, somehow. So I think there's a way to feel like the absence is present because we have this memory from this place, no? Somehow. But I don't know. I think it's it's like a challenge, and also it's a beautiful thing to think that uh, it's poetry. It's a uh, object theater take us much farther. And we can take so many ways to talk about things that doesn't need the presence. We can have all that it's around. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, so writing as well so far discussion, writing objects and memory. And so I'm wondering, I don't think we were artists, but not necessarily writers. So I'm wondering, how does writing relate to your performance and your work? Well, of course, it, ins it inspires the writing, 
for me, I produce out of the object or out of the puppet. So this is first and the writing comes after that. But this de always depends on, on where I'm working on. Yeah. So sometimes also a poem of writing can inspire me a lot. And then I, I search for something which combines that. But and like for the show yesterday, there were first the objects and the, 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 the puppets and then the writing came. Yeah, me is similar working with the objects. They they are really actually the the material where you jump and you write around. So the paper is really the space and you are part of it and the objects take you to the places and you just keep notes yeah. somehow. And I nourish it with lots of reading during the process because there's been people that it's been writing about what I'm looking for in some way that they can give me lots of clues. But uh, I need the objects to take me to places that are unexpected. But then after, I need also a lot of, uh, uh, well, work that it's been done uh, before. I think for me, my experience with writing is very different because I do so much that is hands-on and so much containing, uh, connecting to the past and the present at the same time. Much of the writing I do is either academic or, or labels for exhibits and things, or maybe it's for presentations or papers to be published and things like that. Um, but for me, I think what I love most is uh, before any of that, I love that brainstorming. You know, maybe I'm sitting just inside my own head thinking about things or with a friend and just kind of mind mapping and free flow mm -hmm. association you know, just to kind of get everything on paper. And then you can always come back to it, you know, 20 years later, 10 years, um, because I have so many ideas for these creative projects that I don't have time for right now. So for me, it's about getting it on paper. Draw, sometimes it's just drawing it out. Yeah. Well, we follow up to that question. Writing, writing about how each of you might define the idea or act of writing personally, not necessarily as the written word, but as uh, we move into new and evolving forms of technology, could writing not also be uh, coding to write code? Or, uh, Savvy, with your workshop this after uh, this morning, excuse me, you talked about creating a, a sentence, but it was in terms of action and object, and it also leads me to believe about the idea of, of rewriting memory, about how we emotionally feel towards something we think we remember and how that changes over time. So I'm curious how each of you might define writing in an abstract sense as it relates to the work that you're doing. So you mean writing as a process to keep something in a memory? Yeah. I think uh, related to our work, uh, the way we write is to keep on moving <laughs> and to keep things busy in a way that remind you where they come from and where you are going on. So you are just uh, having the opportunity to, to what you were saying, to have a kind of brainstorming while you are uh, reconnecting with what's going on because it's what uh, well we said uh, for example language is full of movement because the verbs are full of actions and we just hold things that have a noun so what we have to do in some way when we are working with objects is just to give uh, the opportunity to them to happen so we need time and this is what I always say I'm working with the time I, it's, I am obsessed with it I need to hold it and to place it in a place. And because I have something between my hands, I can, I can feel it because I cannot go too quick because it will vanish. So time helps me to order my ideas because I have things between my hands 
and in my body if I move around a place and I set my things around, this will help me to classify what I am imagining. And then little by little, these things that are all around will become uh, autonomous. I will be there and I will be trying to remember where they come from, but also I will be listening to them. So for me it's an opportunity. Listening it's a kind of memory because uh, if I don't listen, I forget. And usually it happens in life. You are listening to somebody, but you are not there. So how would you keep the attention for that? I like that. We often say listening to the material or the puppet okay. because they will tell you the story which is with them then. Mm -hmm. And they tell it through movement or through their shape or through their... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. When I think about memory or in, in, then I, and if I look at my show, it has a lot of different layers of writing. There's the body movement, like the, my body yeah. memory, which is there, which reminds my movements. And then there's the script, which writes all these movements down. And then there's the, the language. And then there's the sculpture, which also like has the memory inside. I wouldn't, and then of course there's the programming there, like the codes, but um, I wouldn't define them all as writing. Yeah. When I think of your question, what stood out to me was writing and coding, and not all, not all people would agree with me on what I consider to be writing. So. Sometimes when I'm writing, it's not with words on paper. Sometimes it might be with my cell phone because my hands are occupied doing other things, leaving myself notes um, as, as modern technology, um, but also in weaving. You know, you can weave your ideas and your thoughts into textiles, and it's a type of writing. When we When we look at all of these paintings around the room, they're physical representations of something that's inside somebody's head that they did. They engaged their brain with an idea that went down to their hand, that went down to canvas or paper. But you can also weave the ideas into something you're doing. And there are a lot of different art forms where people weave their intentions and their ideas, whether it be actual weaving, it could be painting, it could be um, even with beadwork where they're encoding those ideas into the artwork. So I think when we think about artwork and writing, it's very broad. It can be very technical writing, it can be very creative writing, or it can be a type of coding maybe other people wouldn't understand. Yeah. And is it writing or is it more the expression? Mm -hmm. How I put, uh, how I, uh, which tool I find to express myself. Mm -hmm. Is there any writing that has inspired your work or um, inspired your journey? Yes. Which one? No, no. I'm, well, I don't know, but uh, I keep on reading and I just move from one place to another with some books that I need them. Very close. Uh, uh, well, for example, I've been t telling this morning about Johanny Payasma, it's an architect that I've been reading these last years. And he writes and explains himself in a way that I just try to to keep it like a Bible. Like sometimes, like now, it, where I am living, in years ago it was Margarillo Senar. It opened my mind in a way that I could feel the meaning of having an a gesture that had something to do with it because I learned from that capacity of being complete, having the the contemplative way of watching what's what's the story and what can give you. And in here in America, I like a lot Paul Astor, really, all his essays and biography, the well, what he writes about the interjournal, uh, things that he's been researching. So, for me, for me, it's a poem. I, I love, um, I love poems and the the emotional um, things they 
safe transport, because I think it's very similar to the three what we do. Like we, we compromise in, not, not compromise, we compress. So we've taken an emotion or a state and we put it in one scene or in one puppet. Mm -hmm. And so often it responds to me in a very emotional way. And then I can see which character can come out of there. Yeah. I would agree about poetry. Um, some and it doesn't take much. It can just be one line that just stays with me, and that can be like the catalyst for an entire uh, piece of work. I can't think of any particular quote off the top of my head, or it, um, but I just know that's how the process works for me. <laughs> That's a very nice one, I think. Um, it's in German, but I can I try to translate it. Um, don't get tired. Always hold your hand open to the wonder. So, so nicht müde werden, sondern genau auf Deutsch nicht müde werden, sondern dem Wunder die Hand hinhalten. Anyone else have a question? Hello. I don't know if it actually works, but yes. imagination. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, I think my question was, what was it? I was trying to formulate it. Um, in terms of technology, uh, technology advancing the way we consume media now, uh, mostly, you know, mostly on technology. A, maybe a puppet show or um, in general and also the uh, way consume and, and, and remember um, and the way that maybe how technology has changed has maybe informed or changed your own memories as artists. Uh, yeah, I'm curious about the artist and just the audience side if, um, yeah, maybe. I don't know if it's harder to remember things now for some people or that's just the same or the way we're exposed to uh, rapid fire information, 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 information. Uh, yeah, I wonder if that has any effect on the way you guys have uh, used your memories to inform your, your art um, or you've experienced with people who have seen it. Uh, yeah, if anything that speaks to that came to you. I think, for me, yes. I mean, we have, oh, there's so many pictures out there, much more than before. And you can use them as a resource. And this can be very positive. And you also can, they can be also overwhelming. So I think it's very, it gives a lot of responsibility to you as an artist or as a person, what to choose and not to get overwhelmed by the amount of pictures. But I also think it's a big chance and what I see with my kids, they when they see the pictures, because it's so close, there are so many, they remember very early events because they see the picture and then it's connected to us because we tell the stories. So it's not only the, the picture, but the emotion and story which is connected with this picture. So their memories start much earlier than my memories because we tell so much stories when we look through the pictures. That's not the picture alone, it's not the technology alone, but in combination as a little um, reminder, I think it can be, uh, be very nice and create very deep or long memories. I, I think um, technology is not helping that much in, for me in my work. <laughs> Uh, I can feel it in my work, in myself, that I have less patience and I I have to fight with it. I I would like to to be more patient with my work. I would like to, to spend longer time without distracting myself with the phone or with things. So I have a little battle in myself. And also what I've seen with the audience is that uh, if you give them 
another timing, uh, they get really nervous. Mm -hmm. And or some of them fall asleep. So it's nice. Some of them what? Fall asleep. So I think people get so relaxed that that they start getting a kind of uh, it's what they've experienced. I I just say kind of well to share it. But uh, what happened to me is that uh, I cannot afford so much information, and I don't need it because uh, really uh, it, 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 I can not hold it for so much. And when I am sharing with people my work. Uh, I need another timing, and um, sometimes it's happening that uh, it's it's a kind of difficult to to keep this attention. I would agree with our in memory work that I do that the consumer um, the cons on the consumer end there's not the same patience. It used to be that you could sit and a storyteller or a performer could talk or, or do their performance for a, an extended period of time and have the attention of the audience. Since everybody went remote a number of years ago and with the advent of the one minute video, I've mm -hmm. noticed and the swipe to get rid of the content you don't want, I've noticed that attention span has changed drastically because I work with people of many different ages, you know, from very young people right on through. and. Um, I've noticed a decline in attention span, I think, is one of the biggest things, and that affects the work that I do. Because now, if, if you want to get the same effect that you once had, how do you do that? Very often, where people will say, oh, that's an important story. Tell it in five minutes. What? <laughs> <laughs> And how do how does the integrity of the art hold up to the to the watching the time? You mentioned earlier time can be valuable, you know, in in the creation and everything. But sometimes the time can be detrimental to art and memory work. And how do we change that? I think we're doing great. I just want to say thank you to everybody here in the audience because you're all holding in with us. <laughs> as, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's really rewarding um, to see that everybody's holding in with us. <laughs> no one is filming. <laughs> <laughs> well, also with technology, um, like my last production wouldn't have happened without all the pictures. You know, I, I like the, there's a community out there in the internet which shares a lot, and I work the, all this robotic stuff. If they wouldn't have shared, I couldn't learn it so easily. So again, I, it, I am a little bit um, afraid to say this is all bad. It, it, it just gives you as a consumer a, lo a big responsibility how you act with it. Mm -hmm. Yes, so it's, it's not to, to let you, you know, get overswept or overwhelmed, but to use it. And, there, and it's amazing to see how the people share so and for free they just want to share so it's also a platform for for for, for communication and relation and and um, exchange mm -hmm. in another level mm -hmm. so we think about um the technology it's almost like a ba bag of jelly beans you have your favorite flavor in there mm -hmm. and then there are some you don't like so much that that's what, what just came i just got this visual that i had to share <laughs> I, I love technology. Um, just sometimes I worry about technology too. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to ask a question. Earlier you were talking about listening as part of the process objects. And I'm really interested. I mean, I think on one level with technology, objects are becoming beings um, that have their own memories. Um, that, I think that's maybe where the future is going. But I'm more curious with that aside of how objects have their own memories that are independent of the memories that we give them. It feels like there's been a lot of talk about the memories we put into objects and that they hold those memories. But I'm actually curious in your work, do the objects have agency? Do they have 
their own memories that are that you're not professed with that aren't one of your and just to prep you guys you have about five more minutes mm -hmm. uh, yeah i think uh listening uh objects and rescuing these uh memories it's really uh difficult <laughs> it's really a challenge i will not say i i i got it <laughs> because i'm not a, a, a magician that can what i can try is to do the work of a interpreter mm -hmm. like a, a, if i have a notebook like the one of Hedy, things easily forgotten that it's full of notes and rewriting. I just try to understand it and I just uh, place it in where it belongs to. And then, for example, for this show, what I did is that I invited a lot of people to see the process that could have been experiencing that notebook before, so old people. And so they could bring these memories alive. The notebook arrived where it arrived. So people were, said, were telling me, oh, this reminds me. Oh, this I could. So finally, I was trying to look for answers where I could get them. So the listening comes to me from the object, but also where the object takes me. And sometimes it's inspiration. It's something that you know you are uh, making up things but also they take you to a place that it's real it's the observation first also like if it has bumps how it smells how it waits mm. it's, it's all this in there and this is the i think this is the story of the object themselves mm. it's the physical manifestation um, and then my task is to observe it and then to listen and then comes the step of interpretation and where to put it. I would agree and um, time is a big part of that. Sometimes it, it's not obvious what the memory is and what you were both saying about interpretation. Sometimes you just have to sit there with the object and as was already said, observe and listen and use all of your senses with it and be very patient <laughs> and hopefully it tells you what it needs to tell you if not you sit with it longer <laughs> <laughs> well you ask technology yeah. <laughs> all right thank you guys so much for being here and thank you all for coming um that is the end of our panel oh. Thank you so much, Alex. <laughs>